Call a meeting to order, and the first item of business will be the Pledge of Allegiance. to approve the minutes from the board meeting of January 4th, 2021. Motion. Motion Second. Sue. Second to Ashley. All in favor? Aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Okay. Then I'm going to open the floor for public participation. Anybody has anything they'd like to? Oh, we we'll are going to hands go up. Go ahead. I think we have a microphone for you and everything. So as you see, like we're all here today. Um, so it was brought to our knowledge that it could potentially be talked about sports and our decision on either progressing them or ending them for tonight during this board meeting. And we all had something that we'd like to say and we all wanted to be able to come here tonight and just give our opinion on that and be able to express our feelings on that subject. So I will start from a couple people on their sayings they really wanted to be here tonight, but unfortunately they had family events, so they weren't able to. So a couple of them wrote some notes that I'll read for you first. So this is from Allie Baker, and she says, I think we should be allowed to continue what's left of our basketball season for many reasons. Basketball not only provides a nice mental break from school and work, but it's also a very important part of people's lives as well. Seniors deserve the chance to play their final season, and so does everyone else. COVID is a scary thing for many people, but by using proper precautions and wishing to continue the availability of the vaccine, I feel that it's something we should be able to be allowed to do again. If you're scared, I understand. So don't come. Many of us have a high chance of being completely okay, and the effects of COVID would be less hurting us than the effect of not having a season. In conclusion, many of us would rather risk us having a season than feeling the despair of missing it. This is from one other team member, and she also states multiple other things about basketball prevailing on our mental health and health and really struggling. And she states at the end that it feels as one normal thing in the crazy world right now, and not having it to be able to rely on is very, very struggling. We will respect all decisions that are made, and we know that you have your, all of our safety in mind, but we would really appreciate you to hear us out. I also have a note from Anna Masonville. As an athlete and senior at Scroon Lake, I was very pleased to hear the news regarding the possibility of beginning a competitive basketball season. For myself and many others, sports are a crucial part of high school and for many reasons, although we have been so grateful for the opportunity to practice basketball for the past two months, there's a great difference between pr practicing for no definite purpose and having a season for a clear goal. This affects everything from team moral, general interest, worth ethic, and in fact, every aspect of the game. From a student's perspective, we are coming upon a year of not having sports, and for many, including myself, this has been incredibly discouraging, if not detrimental. Although there is added risk with doing anything this year, I feel that the state has made a decision that takes into account both the safety and well-being of all students. I sincerely hope that Screen Lake decides to participate in resuming of a basketball season for the sake of the students and their families. Thank you. And I also wrote something on behalf of people here. I'm sorry that I'm the only one talking and kind of just wanted to be able to represent my team and as captain and as leader and as somebody who's been, you know, also very active in the school. I feel as if it's my turn and my step up to be able to be a leader to not only the girls on the team, but also to the cheerleaders who are here who are really excited for their season that will also get canceled. So there's a lot of different liabilities on the line for everyone around. So I would just like to say on behalf of my team and the boys team who are also like to be represented in these younger teams and cheerleading, I'd like to give my insight on the topic in hopes that we continue to allow it. 
I understand that the public health departments need to have a say prior to schools. And I'm also aware that Essex County still hasn't given a defi definite answer, but I'm almost positive that they will leave it up to the surrounding schools. If this is the result in the end and our school does get the final say, I'd like to think that students would be the ones to weigh their opinions in and have a great deal in this decision making as well, as the board is here to bring the best for the kids. I know for me personally, basketball has been a huge impact on my life, and obviously that's no secret. Men medically, physically, mentally, and overall benefits me as a person. And I can't only sit, stand here and speak for myself, because I know there's a great group of students here and outside of surrounding areas who feel this way too, and understand that the difference basketball and other sports impact their lives greatly. Not only would taking basketball away harm us mentally, as we, I've stated before, and also a lot of students have as well. It would also be getting rid of cheerleading, which has also been growing increasingly in size throughout this year with many students interested. I speak on behalf of friends, family, coaches, and my teammates when I say we need basketball and we need to be heard. This year not only has been stressful, it's been mentally taxing and completely exhausting. If we're being weary about this decision due to safety precautions, then that can't honestly be the real reason. Most who aren't worried that COVID will affect us not only haven't studied the results completely, but also have been listening to Cuomo and abiding by his rules. I'm very thankful for the staff and the board members here who are working in best interest for our students. But these rules were just recently lifted by Cuomo and restrictions have been lowered. If his rules were so well done and so understood beforehand, then I don't understand why we can't listen to him now. Cuomo and the government both know that this is safe overall and that's why his decisions were best done to mentally prepare the students for their lives in the future. This physically would be damaging and mentally damaging on students if we choose not to. Every other state is playing and every other state understands the severity of COVID and as do I and as do my fellow teammates and fellow cheerleaders. I understand that this is very taxing, but it seems unfair to not abide by his rules after doing so for so long. We would appreciate consistency and we do really need our sports. So thank you for listening to us and we really appreciate your time. Hey. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, I'm gonna close the floor to public participation and we'll move on with the agenda. Um, get a motion to approve warrant number six, please. Second. Jared seconds Ashley, all in favor? Aye. 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 Everybody opposed? Uh, treasurer's report. We received $568,133.39 in the month of December. Um, the highlights of those amounts are um, some state aid, um, excess cost aid for $63,812 dollars and 68 cents. Uh, some miscellaneous transfers um, received for hospital insurance from uh, retired employees. Um, the cafeteria transmittal. Uh, we also received, uh, deposited 500 from the CD that just came due and uh, reinvested 1 million five of that CD. Um, sadly to say the rate is only a 0.15 which is not very good. Um, and also I did uh, check today to see if we had received any of the lunch money. Uh, we finally did on January 26. We received all of our, what was owed to us, which was October, November, December to the tune of $55,931. And uh, that is a larger amount that we've had in the past because Mrs. Uh, Holbrook um, got a grant to uh, be able to, so we could feed all the kids and uh, done a really good job. Good. Get a motion to accept the treasurer's report. Please. Motion. Motion to sue. Second. Second to Ashley. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Everybody opposed? It's carried. I'll acknowledge the budget status. Um, get a motion to approve the extracurricular report. Motion. Motion is Ashley. Second shared. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, we need a motion to approve the tax assessment refund. Motion. Kevin. Kevin. Okay. 
And those were um, assessments that were taken to small claims. And I was called yesterday to find out where we were at, and I said, I just received those last week. Um, those were dated December 18th. I think that's kind of late for us to be getting those. They're supposed to be done within 30 days from when they put them in, and they were sent to, um, to Essex early, before September, because our role wasn't even out yet. <coughs> and um, the decision wasn't even made till October 30th. Yeah. So it's, uh, I did bring them to you instead of just putting it on the financial. I just figured it would be quicker if the board could see them ahead of time. And it will be on the warrant for the next board meeting, but they will be paid this week. Okay, got a motion. We have a second. Second. Seconds, Ashley. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Be opposed? Carried. Superintendent's report. Okay, thank you. Well, the first and only item is the independent auditor report corrective action plan. And basically what happened was a year or so, we get more than a year, the comptroller came and did an audit of all of our records and kept Danielle very busy for a great amount of time looking at everything. And they were very pleased with our auditing system and all that we've done. They did give us two areas that they would like us to improve upon. One is the uh, differentiation of duties of our financial department. And so Danielle does quite a lot, but uh, we need to differentiate her duties a little bit and streamline it for other people to get involved. And, <clears throat> and the second was a fund balance in excess of 4%. 4% is what you're supposed to have. We have more than 4%. So these are things that we've, we've been cited for before. They're hard things to, uh, to fix. So anyway, uh, we did write a corrective action plan and explaining how we were going to address these issues. And we got you to approve that a while back. Uh, they sent it back and said, hey, you didn't tell us when. So I've never heard that before that they want to know the date, but they do. So, so we've put a date into our corrective action plan. We've told them we will address these two issues by June of 2022. And so we have a new corrective action plan that we would ask you to approve. So that's usually the same thing that we get dinged on just about every time they audit us. So. Yeah. Um, do we need a motion to approve that? I think you do. Okay. Yes, please. Second. Second Sherrod. Second. Second Sue. All in favor? Aye. 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 Everybody opposed? <coughs> Carried. And we'll discuss this again in June of 2022 and let you know how we're doing. Okay. Uh, that was the only item I had, but uh, Melina and her friends spoke eloquently about sports, and it is the talk of the town. So perhaps we ought to spend a little time on that, even though it's not on the agenda. You okay with that? Mm -hmm. yes. All right. So let me tell you what I know, and um, I don't know if I know everything. I'm sure I do not. But uh, on Friday, the announcement was made by, made by the state that schools in New York State could begin high contact sports, full contact sports. And that was a bit of a shocker to everybody. I'm, I'm not sure anybody knew that was coming. Uh, the ability to do this is contingent upon approval by the Essex County, well, for us, it's the Essex County Health Department. Uh, so I've had several meetings with superintendents and with the County Health Department and uh, with Matt Wallentuck, the head of sports for C the CDAC and the MVAC, discussing uh, possibilities and what it would look like if we came back. And more, Essex County, of course, talked most about whether we should come back. And so I, I got a, e a call from Linda Beers about a half an hour ago, and she said, we just sent you an email with a lot of new information. So I haven't read that information. Uh, but she did, I'll tell you what she said the other day, and then I'll tell you what she said today. What, what, what I heard from her the other day is that um, Essex County is going to go ahead and request from the state permission for schools in Essex County to play basketball and cheerleading and any other sports that you might have, high contact sports. And uh, they're going to go down the road of doing that. And then once they get approval, then each school would need to write a report um, explaining how they would safely return to sports should they choose to do so. 
and then that report is going to be um, over, going to be looked at by Essex County. They're not actually going to approve it. They're just going to check it out for us. It also has to be approved by the medical director, our, med our school medical director. So if Essex County gets permission from the state, if we write a plan and, Essex, and our health director looks at it and Essex County Health Department looks at it and you guys approve it, then we are free to return to interscholastic sports. Now she called me today and she said uh, that Essex County had worked in conjunction with several other counties, most to the south, and that all of them had signed on to the same document to send to the state, basically saying, and again, I'm, I'm kind of telling you what she said to me, but I haven't read this yet, so I may not get every detail correct, but the gist of it was that all of these counties agreed that they would only uh, return to interscholastic sports if they had a less than a 4% positivity rate in their county. I believe that means the number of people, of all the people getting tested 4% or, you know, less, less than 4% are testing positive. So she said that that is what all of these counties have agreed to. And she said out of all the counties that signed on, none of them are under 4% except us. So, and we are at, uh, I believe she said 3.3%. So we are, we, we, we are free to go ahead and take the next step should we choose to do so to play interscholastic sports. Clinton County, who is the, the people we play most of all, um, was not part of this exact agreement, or if they were, they didn't quite sign on to the 4% thing. So I'm, I'm not sure that um, Clinton County, um, whether they're able to play or not. Uh, I do know that one of the stipulations is that uh, you have to be in session for a certain number of time to be able to play, and most of the, Essex, most of the Clinton County schools are not in session. So it's, uh, it'd be a limited, certainly a limited number of schools that are going to be able to participate in this activity. And then, of course, they have to be willing to participate in this activity. And I've already talked to a couple schools that aren't going to, but uh, when I last spoke to Mr. Silvernail about this, he said it, pretty much the people who were interested in playing soccer um, were, are interested in playing basketball. So I think there's five or six schools that have interest in actually having an interscholastic sports season. So it would probably be advisable for us to give this some thought, but I, I don't think there's a rush to make a firm decision on whether or not you're going to approve this because it's, you know, the can is going to be kicked down the road a little bit because we have to make a plan before we can begin. Now I say that before we begin, but in fact, uh, we've been playing something, something for quite a while. In the beginning of December, we started um, workout sessions with some basketballs around. And uh, it's not basketball, certainly it would be hard to call it basketball, but certainly our athletes are getting out there. Uh, they have been very, very receptive to this. Uh, and I compliment the boys and girls who are going to practice every night and almost playing basketball, but not quite playing basketball. I don't know if I could do it. I'd get bored after the first few minutes of running laps, but they seem to be having a great time. I commend our basketball coaches, Mr. Silvernail and Mr. Dumoulin and Mr. Cutting and Mr. Hartwell and Mrs. Hartwell for run, making this happen. And it's, it's, been, it's been great. It's really been great that they've had this opportunity to play. I think they've enjoyed it. Uh, everybody I talked to is very happy about it. So we're already in a better position than some other schools. Oh, by the way, though, if we do decide to go down this road, uh, those activities do not count toward the number of practices you would need to play. You'd have to start over. So as you ponder this very difficult concept, and it is very difficult because um, we all love to see our kids play basketball, but we are also in the middle of a pandemic, and we have had tremendous success. I don't know how many schools in New York State have not missed a single day of in-person education this year, but we have not missed a single day of in-person education this year, and that's a testament to a heck of a lot of things, not least of all the fact that these uh, players are, these students are observing social distancing rules in school, and they're wearing masks, 
Teachers have done a great job with that. Our custodial staff, uh, they deserve medals for keeping this place so clean. So we are in a great position right now in the middle of a pandemic. And so everybody here, everybody out there on, uh, on Facebook, I'm sure can see both sides of this issue. Boy, would we like to see you play. Boy, do we not want to risk bringing any disease into this school. So I will tell you that I met with the safety committee today and we discussed this very topic. And of course, every member of the safety committee can see both sides of the issue. Um, so we talked about it quite a bit and I would say that the vast majority of the people on the committee, although one abstained, suggested that we do not play interscholastic sports for fear of catching a virus. In particular, there's also the Great Britain uh, virus is now in Essex County. However, and, and, and I'm sure that's very disappointing to some, and you can, you, know, you can take the safety committee's opinion if you wish. But the other thing to consider is there's, there's sort of a middle of the road option that I would recommend that you consider. And the, that is basically that going to practice and almost playing basketball is not as good as going to practice and playing basketball. So I would suggest that we take a middle of the road approach and we do whatever we have to do to become an interscholastic sports school, thus enabling ourselves to have full basketball practices uh, when they go each night and actually play basketball amongst themselves. So the safety committee felt that the risk of spreading disease within the school was worth the benefit to play internally. However, they did not feel that the risk imposed by playing interscholastic sports was worth it. So that is the official recommendation of the safety committee that we, we do what we have to do to be able to play basketball, full basketball in practice, but that not, we do not play interscholastic sports. And just one more thing to think about, because there's only about a million things to think about as this topic crosses your mind. Keep in mind, if we say to our students, yep, you can go play interscholastic sports, but, oh, by the way, the gym classes, they still have to stay 12 feet apart. Um, are we going to also say to our play our drama club. You guys can now start um, doing your practices. Are we going to say to our, you know, the junior prom, they want to have a prom. Can they have a, can they have a full contact prom? Maybe that's not the per right choice of words there, but can they have a prom? Um, what, what about all the other activities that we have that we are not doing? Um, how can we do the sports things without doing all of the other things? So those are some thoughts for you to uh, think about and you can discuss if you wish. Again, you don't have to make a decision at this moment, but you're free to do as you will. Do we have to jump through all these hoops? Basically, we're talking intramural play, correct? I'm not sure. Um, in my brief conversation with Linda, she said that you could start doing it while you, you could start practicing while you're going through the plan writing process. But I mean, if we set up a, a team structure within the school, yep. do we still have to jump through all of I think you do. that we would have to do for interscholastic? You're going to have to do something, but that's, that's not something that would be difficult to do, probably. It might take a little time. Are all the schools in our league in Essex County? No. No, they're not. And out of the, I think he, I think Lee told me there was about six schools. One of them was Shazy there in Clinton County. So I'm not sure they'd be able to play right away anyway. I'm not, I'm not sure they wouldn't either. I'm just not sure. Uh, most of the others, Willsboro, Boquet Valley were on the list, I think. And so other schools in the area are thinking about it. I know that Minerva for sure is not playing, but they're in a different county. I think the fact that we've just discovered the UK variety in Essex County is a little concerning that, you know, we have no idea where that's going. Supposedly it's a little more virulent and a little easier spread and um, not necessarily more deadly, but, you know, from what they say, but, but definitely easier spread. I don't know what, what the feeling of the rest of the board is. I'm pro sports, always have been. 
the vaccine's been out. People are starting to get that for second doses. It's supposed to protect against the, str the strain as well. I'm not, I, if we're keeping it in our county, I don't see why there's a problem. In a sense, our school districts are already mingling without the kids going there. We have parents that work in other towns that are working with kids from other towns that go home. So in a sense, we're already co-mingling with other towns as it is. Generally with masks and social distancing, yeah. Ideally. Maybe, <laughs> but I can t the mill. Half our, t half our parents work at the mill. There's a ton of employee uh, staff at, from the mill in town here. Mm -hmm. You're, you're commingling with Ty, who just had a huge outbreak. You're commingling with Crown Point, with people, there are people that drive from Glens Falls, but you've got all of Essex County and Warren County and Clinton County that travel. They're going home to their kids who are mm -hmm. bringing whatever they just met with home to everybody else's kids. Now you're bringing it to a different school. We're already commingling. Right. It, it is not competitive. So they are mostly maintaining their six foot distance and they are um, wearing masks. So they are running drills. Some of the boys I know spend a lot of time in the weight room. I'm sure Melina could answer this question better than I can, but uh, that's what they're supposed to be doing is maintaining distance according to the, the rules that are put out by the state. Uh, Melina, you wanna comment on that at all? Here's an interesting fact that I recall from Mr. Wallentoff's presentation. Um, every state in the country, with the exception of six or seven, if you count in New York, have already started basketball. I have no problem with it. At least graduating would be proper work to at least a more competitive practice. That's better than what they're doing now. We're still going to have to wait to see if Essex County gets a clearance. We're still going to have to wait to see if the state will allow it. But at least it's something more than them literally doing what they can do in their living room with some parents. Well, the biggest thing is, too, is how many other schools are going to say that uh, but why exactly. got to run out of the vision. Exactly. But at least at least now, in, within the school, they can get a little bit more. Oh, yeah, there. that's... They're already sitting next to each other all day and even lunch next to each other all day. But in Tulliasia, it's not the close contact. I think it's wonderful the schools are able to be open every day this year. Um, and I, I hate to think by bringing uh, students in from other communities that we would maybe have in bring in the virus along with that. I think we have to consider safety, not only the school, but other communities. I think Ashley had a good point, of course. But I think um, the fact it's high, high, high contact is a problem. If they're sitting in a classroom, they're six feet apart with masks on. Um, we talk about basketball with close contact. Um, I, and I, I feel if we could do that within the school, within our students here and have competition, that's what I, I think we should do. And not bring, not bring people in. I mean, yeah, I agree still with have you. to wait for clearance, but at least let them start being a little more with each other. Yes, I agree with that. Somebody pointed out to me today that Okay, the governor said, yeah, you can do it with certain caveats. Well, the, town of the health department of the county, there's certain caveats with that. When it rolls down to us, they said, look, what's going to happen when you say, okay, yeah, we can do that, and suddenly you start having COVID cases. Are they going to blame the governor? Are they going to blame the Essex County Health Department? No going to be our baby mm -hmm. and it's going to be us that made the decision and and it's going to carry into areas that you're not really you know thinking about right now you know, how it's going to be how the reaction is going to be with certain other groups but, you know, I think I think if we can keep it in in-house mm -hmm. at least 
until we get a better understanding of what's going on, um, that we'd be better off. You know, I think you know, I think it's something. Do you agree with us allowing them to be a little more competitive in-house? Oh, absolutely. But I'm I'm just saying that you know, in terms of of interscholastically, I've got a concern, and I really would like to get yeah, we're too a little more feedback. On I'm too far up right now from being able to make a decision on that. Yeah, that's the way I feel about it too, and I think that. Um, you know, down the road a ways, maybe we can make a different decision, but right now I think that interscholastic or inter intermurally would, would be the best bet. All right, well, I'll, I'll put the full court press on to get uh, Essex County to allow us to play ball in practice as much as possible, and um, you can consider it, and as long as you're practicing, if, you know, if something changed, you could start playing, I guess. If we jump through the hoops in terms of, you know, putting the plan together, but we don't necessarily play interscholastically, mm -hmm. um, well, can't we count those as practices? So if we do we, decide we to go? Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm saying. This this puts us in a position where we can make a different decision later if, if things are different. So we can make a decision and we wouldn't have to wait six practices to yeah. before there yeah. would be a game. Everybody good with that? I'd be okay with that. But Sue, you pointed out the high contact thing. How many, Melina, how many kids do you hang out with outside of school, no masks? <laughs> that right there. I don't even need an answer. That right there tells me that just because they're in school with these masks, these I see them walking up and down the school, or up and down the street every day, all day. They're together, no masks, we've had no cases. I hope not all day. I hope they probably won't be able to be vaccinated until summer. I mean, they're talking months down the road, probably after school closed. I mean, so we're not, students will not be getting vaccinated, at least when I'm reading anyway, for months, unfortunately. Yeah. They're not even sure of the efficacy of it right now with yeah. certain age with, groups. Yeah, with the variant. But, but I, and I understand that, but at the same time, there, we're already, we can't project our fears onto our kids. We just can't. Sure. We can't take everything away from them when they're doing it when no one's around anyway. You have a point? You don't let them play in the street, though, do you? <laughs> if I'm not there, who's stopping them? <laughs> Honestly. I understand that. Yeah. Okay. I guess I'll, get, I'll get the ball rolling as fast as I can. Okay. We'll do the best we can. And that concludes my uh, superintendent's report. Okay, we need a motion to approve the CSE recommendations. Motion. Motion second. Kevin. Kevin second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, we need an appointment of the English as a new, a new language. language. <laughs> Formerly known as English as a second language. That's what I was going to say. That's what it used to be. It yeah. did used to be, yes. Uh, we're fortunate to have Ektrina Lambeth, who is uh, willing to be our, our uh, ENL teacher. We have a few students in school who will benefit from her services. She's already worked for us a few days uh, for free, coming in and testing these students and meeting with the teachers. Uh, she seems very well qualified, so I recommend you approve her contract. The motion, please. Motion. Motion to actually second Jared. All in favor? Aye. 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 Anybody opposed? It's carried. Okay, 2021-2022 uh, school calendar. Um, <clears throat> have you all seen the uh, latest version? We sent out a new version today. I have a copy here if you'd like it. Yes, would you like a copy or are you all set? I think we're set. Okay. We were going with option three. Uh, there, there were uh, three choices that we gave the teachers union for our parent teacher, for a configuration for parent teacher conferences. They chose option three, which I also have here for you if you'd like. And um, we, I'm, I'm prepared to go along with that request if you are. Okay. Motion to approve the 2021-2022 school calendar, please. Motion. Motion, Jared. Second, Sue. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anybody opposed? It's carried. A motion to approve the sale of the weight equipment. Uh, at our last board meeting, we approved, they enabled us to advertise and sell 
some equipment in the weight room, and uh, it was sold for $350, so we'd like you to approve that sale if possible. How much is it Motion, Jared. Second, Kevin. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, we need a second read of the policy, independent educational evaluations. There were some changes made. I presume everybody has mm -hmm. looked those over and yep. yeah. we've got our legal team approved it. Second. Second, Sue, all in favor? Aye. 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 Anybody opposed? It's carried. Okay. Down to the meat and potatoes of the budget. Okay. So are you ready for a budget workshop? Seems oh, like sure. we just did this. <laughs> the, last one, the last one dragged out till what, June or July? I, I don't know. know. Um, I am willing to turn my head for a moment and pretend I'm not looking if the players don't want to stay for the uh, budget presentation. But if, <laughs> but if they do... Shame on them. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Have a good night. Good night. Thank you, you too. Thank you. I'm, I'm pleased to see that um, Ms. Crandall and Ms. Bellinger elected to stay. So. <laughs> <laughs> it was a risky move on my part, but it, it worked out. Um, I'm just going to bring up my presentation here for you. I don't know, you might want to move to the front row, I'm not sure. Or just turn, whatever you prefer. Yeah, probably move. Boy, I cleared out fast. Didn't I? Oh, it's too bad. Melina left. She didn't even get to see her face. There she is. There's <laughs> Melina and Anna and Kaylee. Kaylee left as well. So yes, let's talk about the budget. And uh, each year is challenging. Each year seems to be more challenging. This one might uh, be the most challenging that I've had in my time. But let's start with the good stuff. Um, always good to see cute kids and uh, to look at where we are with the numbers. And these are the numbers we have right now who are with us. Uh, I would say that, um, well, I think as of today, 177 were in person and, um, and um, 32 are not in person. But I did add three numbers here because we've got three homeschool kids coming back on Monday. And I would say out of those 32 kids who are remote, we've got about eight of those coming back. So things are looking up. Uh, there was, I think, a bit of a concern after Christmas and some parents decided to keep their children home out of an abundance of caution. Uh, and I think some are coming back and we had a lot of kids after vacation who were quarantined and had traveled. So we had a lot of kids out sick, but that has gone down too. So yesterday we only had four students sick and today we only had five. So we're looking good. And so we are serving kids. And just to look at our population, um, we were on a good run there. We were increasing our enrollment every year, and then we hit 2021, or 2020, whichever way you want to look at it. So our numbers have gone down. It's a little deceiving. I think there's probably about, I'm hoping there's about 20, 25 homeschoolers who will come back next year who decided that they wanted to not partake in a socially distanced school. So hopefully this number is going to jump up a bit. But it was destined to go down anyway because we graduated a a very big class for us. We had 25 graduates and we only brought in eight pre-Kers. Uh, but our pre-K numbers will increase as well. So this is uh, you know, a little disappointing, but I think better days are coming. So it certainly has been quite a year and um, I'd like to you know, applaud the faculty and staff for meeting the challenge. You see this about coronavirus public schools being closed and you see it on the news all the time. How are we gonna reopen our schools? Well, we have been open the whole time, and I'm, I'm very proud of that fact. It certainly has impacted everything. Uh, students are learning in a different way. They are socially distanced. They are wearing masks. They're using computers for everything. It is a different world, but we are still being very successful. We're still getting things done safely, so it's been good. And credit where credit is due, 
Uh, teachers, faculty, and staff have done a great job. I'm, I want to compliment them on their hard work and dedication, not necessarily their clothing choice, but their hard work <laughs> and dedication. I thought it was pretty um, good. Volunteers, you know, and substitute teachers have been, and bus drivers have been going out of their way to help make things possible. Uh, School-related professionals day was a while back. Can't say enough good things about our cafeteria staff who is serving our students breakfast and lunch, uh, great breakfast and lunch in their classrooms every day. Uh, the cafeteria has been working seamlessly this year. I've spent very little time worrying about it. Transportation has worked great. Our custodial staff is... Uh, is certainly uh, doing their job to keep the sa school safe and clean. And of course, I could never um, overstate the job that our teacher's aides do. They, without them, the whole place would fall apart. So we are a great place, and we've had a great year. We've had a horrible year and a great year at the same time. And so I'm very proud of where we are. And, but, so we know we're special, but, but not everybody knows we're special because this, unfortunately, is not about uh, cute little pre-K students. It is about money. And when you start talking about money, you have to look at how the state views us. Now, I, I went to a conference last year where I got a lot of cool graphs, and so I'm showing you them again. So I hope you find them as interesting as I do. They are one year out of date. I confess some of, some of these are. If you look at this graph, it's pretty interesting because... We are not that important to New York State. If you look over on the left, you will see the blue bars, and you'll see that there is, um, you know, 15% or so of the schools only have about 2% of the kids in the state. We are clearly in the, uh, the bar on the left, where we have less than one child per square mile. And then if you look over on the right, you see that only about 2% of the schools have I don't know, what is that, 45% of the kids. Incredible what the difference is between an urban school and a rural school. And so it's not hard to understand why the big five, New York City, Buffalo, Rochester, and Syracuse, and Yonkers, uh, they get all of the attention. So when Governor Cuomo makes his decisions, I'd like to think he's thinking about us, um, but certainly it'd be hard not to think about those schools where so many kids go to school. And so... We get crunched, the numbers get crunched, and a number of amount of money comes to us every year. And two big things that they look at are the combined wealth ratio and the free and reduced lunch. Combined wealth ratio tells you how, how rich a school district is, and triple tells you how poor a district is. And these two things are used in the calculation of state foundation aid, which is the biggest chunk of aid that you have. And for the second straight year, the foundation aid will not increase in New York State. So out of the 720 or 30 districts in New York State, 674 get a big chunk of foundation aid. So you're wondering, how much do we get? Well, first you've got to figure out and it's a complicated formula, and there's a big push in New York State to change the formula, but you know how things don't change very quickly. So based on what they have for data for us, <coughs> we are a pretty rich district. 27th highest property rate values in the state, and 266th highest incomes. So our combined wealth ratio based on what the state thinks they know about us, is a 2.871. And as a science guy, I object to any number that doesn't have units, and I don't know what the units are here, but I do know that 2.871 is a big number, 43rd highest in the state. So, love this graph. On the left-hand side of this graph, it tells you the percent of increase in the foundation aid. And on the bottom, it tells you your combined wealth ratio of 2.871. So if you look over there, I wish I had a laser pointer. 2.871 is way over on the right, just above the 2019-2020. So you can see that we, each year, get a very small increase in foundation. Well, actually, this year, everybody got no increase. But um, in the past, if you have a lower combined wealth ratio, you get a pretty big increase. So we're not going to get any more money from the state in this respect. 
And then you've got to think, well, are we rich or are we poor? Part of the problem with finding out if we're poor or not is that the state ranks us on old data. You can see that the census poverty that they use is from the 2000 census. And based on this census, we're not very poor. But I don't, I don't know what was going on here in 2000, but I feel like it is not that indicative of the population that we have now. So we are not viewed as having a lot of, uh, being a poor state, being, having people in the district who are low income, even though we do. And this, this chart may be a little hard to read, but if you can read it, it's very interesting. Because it tells you the two most important things, and it, gives it puts everything in a scale of 1 to 10. So if you look at where that arrow is, that's your combined wealth ratio of all the schools in our BOCES ranked on a scale of 1 to 10. 10 is the wealthiest school, and 1 is the, chief, is the I don't know, not, not wealthiest school. So if you look, there are only three schools that get a perfect 10 for wealthy. And we are one of them. So boy, are we wealthy. And yet if you go to the next column, where it looks like purple, now this is current data. This is not from the 2000 census, this is reality. If you look to see which is the poorest school, or not necessarily the poorest school, but the community with the highest rate of, of, of a free and reduced lunch, you see that we are a two. So we are the poorest school, poorest school district. So we're the richest and the poorest at the same time. So there you have it. What does it mean? Well, I don't know what it means to you, but it means something to the state. They look at all kinds of things as they calculate the money. They also look at your fiscal stress each year. So again, I don't think the state has a real good concept of how much uh, poverty we have in our community. Uh, they do rank us on our fiscal stress, and I guess it's good that we are not fiscally stressed according to the state. We are 13.3, again, no units, um, so we have no designation. We are not fiscally stressed, which is good, I guess. All right, so let's talk about what we're going to do this year, because we've got a whole new year, well, not this year, next year, we've got a year to plan for, and sometime between now and the spring, we've got to put together a budget, figure out what we're going to get for money and what we're going to spend. So where do we get our money? Same old place. 85% um, it comes from the taxpayers. So thank you, thank you, thank you, taxpayers. We realize this is not always easy, but we really appreciate your support. 14% comes from state aid. So the good news is that as we talk about all of the uncertainty in the state economy and the money that we might get from the state, we can survive the capriciousness of New York State better than many schools because although it hurts when they keep our money and don't give us more money, it, it's, we've still got a large tax base to help us out. So this is a, a better picture than many schools in our area have. Again, if you're the guy paying a big tax bill, you might not agree with that, but we do appreciate it. And if you are the person paying a big, big tax bill, this hopefully is some consolation, and this is also my, my favorite graph. It tells the tax rate of Screw Lake Central School and all the other schools on our BOCES per $1,000 of assessed value of your house. So if you look at this, you'll see that we are about eight, eight dollars. And if so, you know, if this is a pretty low number compared to if you lived in the city of Plattsburgh, you'd be looking at more like $23, three times expensive to ha as expensive to have your house in Plattsburgh City. And I've made this comment a few times. I usually go to the senior center and, and say these similar words and and I had one guy say, well, that doesn't mean much to me if you live on the lake and you've got a house that has to pay a lot of taxes. And that is certainly true. Um, but again, we appreciate your support and we're pleased that we have a low tax rate. So what do we have coming in to pay for our expenses? Because we all know every year we look at what we're going to do and we know that the price of everything goes up. And so therefore you've got to pay for it. So this is the governor's state aid proposal. This is in its uh, raw form, and I'm sure you don't want to analyze this because I don't even like looking at it. So let me go on to a bit of a summary for you. 
because it's confusing. And I would say that all the people I've talked to this year and some of the webinars I've been to, uh, Zuru's from the state, tell me this is the most confusing um, budget they've seen, at least the way the information is presented. And there's a lot of questions, but I suppose that's probably what you would expect in a pandemic. So, first of all, this is pretty clear. We're not getting more foundation aid. <clears throat> Each year we get 736,000 and it hasn't changed in a couple of years. Then we have a new category in our state aid called services aid. And basically you used to have a bunch of different line items, you know, BOCES aid, software aid, library aid. And uh, the governor's executive budget proposal takes all of those things and puts them under one category called service aid. So if you added up everything you had for service aid last year, it was $320,000. And next year, we're going to get a little bit more. So yay, 672 more. That's the good news. But then it gets really confusing. When you look at federal money, you hear it all the time. Governor Cuomo says, we need the federal government to fund us. And it was said last year, too. So last year, during the budget process, we got our state aid run. <clears throat> and we found that um, they were taking $98,000 of state aid away from us. But, oh, by the way, they were also adding $98,000 of pandemic aid. And so, you know, I expressed this to you a year ago. My fear was that someday that pandemic aid would go away, and then where would we be? Um, this year, in 2021-2022, they've got us down for $293,000 of COVID-19 stimulus. Now that doesn't sound too bad, but again, everybody I've talked to doesn't really believe it. It's very unclear where this money is coming from. It's not clear that they have this money or that we're automatically going to get it or if we have to apply for it. And possibly it's, it's federal money that we're hoping to get. So I think it's very unclear that this $293,000 exists. And um, I was on a webinar with Chuck Dietrich, the executive director of NISCUS, which is the New York State Council of School Superintendents. And he said, don't, don't count on it. So that's a little unsettling. And then perhaps the most perplexing part of the state budget run is that the STAR program is now listed under state aid, which, as far as I know, has never been done before. It is, uh, it is a taxpayer aid. It is, it is not a school aid, but it's listed as school aid. So if you look, last year, well, the budget says last year, the state paid $164,000 of aid to our taxpayers. Well, thank you, we're happy you did that, and I'm sure our taxpayers appreciate that as well. But this year, the number is 158,000, but then they add local distance funding is 158. So it appears, I probably should have made one of those be negative. It appears that we're responsible for paying this chunk of money that goes to our taxpayers for star tax relief. And so if that is the case, then we're not going to get any star money this year, but we're going to still have it, so we're still going to have to pay. So basically we're not, you know, the $164,000 is going to come out of our pocket. We're going to be less in our budget than they had last year. So that's scary also. So at this point, we don't know much, and we don't count on much. So I'm going to say to you that we think we're going to uh, not count on anything from the state, and we are going to begin creating a budget with no increase in state aid. And we're just going to hope that it doesn't turn out to be a negative, because if we have to pay the star money and the stimulus money doesn't show up, then we're, then, then we're in the red. So not a positive picture as we start. I guess the only redeeming quality here is that these numbers are somewhat low as far as our total budget, again, because... Most of our money comes from our gracious taxpayers. 
So let's talk about our gracious taxpayers and the tax cap. The 2% tax cap exists. Of course, we all know it's not really a 2% tax cap. It is whichever is lower of, the, of 2% or the rate of inflation. So the state recently announced that because the consumer price index is 1.23, then the, the tax cap is not a 2% tax cap. It's a 1.23% tax cap. So that's what the state has to deal with. Of course, each, each school, uh, based on a complicated formula uh, with many factors, generates their own uh, amount of money that they can levy each year, or how much more they can levy. So we're somewhat fortunate in that respect because last year we levied 6,000, oh, I'm sorry, $6,638,000. And oh, by the way, I want to point out that that was a cut of 114,000. So we put forward a budget last year that was so fiscally responsible that it was actually $114,000 less than the previous year. Anyway, that's what we had the year before based on our calculations, very preliminary calculations. This this could change. Um, we can now levy 6,733,000. So that means that we can um, uh, take $94,000 more from the community. And that gives you a tax cap of 1.43, which is slightly higher than last year and slightly higher than the state average. So that's, that's good news. Um, but that's not much. $94,000. So if you think about all the things that could increase in price this year, we've got to cover all of that with $94,000. And last year at this time, we had an estimate for you. We came in to that meeting on January and we said, here's what we think it's going to cost to run the school and, and, and you know, we're not going to have enough, so you're going to have to either make some cuts or use some fund balance or a little bit of both. Uh, with all the uncertainty, we're not at that point right now. So I'm going to conclude my presentation by saying that you now know what we've got coming in and these are the things we still need to look at before we can tell you what our expenses are. And there's several things that we have to know before that. So at our next meeting, we anticipate bringing to you the estimated revenue, which hopefully will maybe be better than $94,000 increase. And we'll bring to you all the costs that we anticipate. And then we'll start discussing how we're going to cover it. Uh, it is uh, almost assured that the costs will be greater than the revenue. Increased costs will be greater than increased revenue. So we'll have to consider what level of deficit spending we want to do. Again, last year when at this meeting, I came to you and we said, listen, we think you're going to have to put about $620,000 of fund balance in. And if you do that, you are seriously deficit spending and we can't survive that for very long. And so we worked to make a fiscally responsible budget that came in around $332,000 $332, of fund balance, which was manageable. And um, that's the kind of decision you're likely going to have to make this year. How much fund balance do you want to use? And, and will you need to make cuts, or what, what will you do? So we'll, we'll probably we'll work hard to get you all that information next meeting. And it certainly won't be final then either, but it'll be something you can work with. So that's, that's what I have for you tonight. I welcome any questions. But if you have none, that's fine too. It was was interesting. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Always is. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, I'll open the floor for public participation. If we want to give us any ideas of where we're going to get a bunch of money, or. <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna have to start playing the lottery or something. We should have got into that. No, yeah. we should have got into the deal on the stock market that they just shut down. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, close the floor to public participation. We're going to need an executive session. Um, I would, actually. Okay.
for the employment history option. Okay, we'll do the uh, matter of medical financial credit <laughs> or employment history of a particular person or corporation or matters leading to the appointment, employment, promotion, demotion, discipline, suspension, dismissal, or removal of a particular person or corporation. Get a motion for executive session, please. Motion. Motions. Second. <laughs> Ashley, Jared, second. All in favor? Aye. 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 I was, he had his hand up. Sure. <laughs> I don't believe there'll be any action coming out, so. <laughs>